So hi guys, um, I think what I don't want to do today is tell you about SEO. I don't want to tell you my lessons around hiring staff. But I want to share uh, things about ISO certification, which we went through, um, and, and sort of like a how to do things. I don't know if it's a different approach, but what I did want to do was explain, I guess tell you my story and tell you some of the, some of the key things that I think that we learned along the way that hopefully will resonate with you and uh, you'll take some, you'll leave some takeaways for you. Now, there's literally, in 30 to 40 minutes I'm given, there's 100 stories more that I'm not going to be able to share with you in that time. So, quite happy if you guys reach out to me, you know, uh, you know, privately on LinkedIn or somewhere else, I'm quite happy to give my time. I don't charge, I'm not a charging advisor or anything like that, but if there's anything I can help you with, just, just let me know. So, um, a little bit about my story, and uh, what I want to start off with, I guess, is, is the big idea. So, I, I really do want to quickly spend a couple of minutes telling you about what it is we do. Effectively, a lot of you know that we, we, we do visitor management. That's what people think we do. It's around about 20% of our business. What we do is we help people manage the presence of visitors, contractors, and employees into all sorts of sites. We do every prison in New Zealand. We do banks in the US. We do manufacturing plants all throughout Europe. We do uh, R&D plants. We do blood plants. We do hospitals. We do the MIQ. Every person that goes in and out of an MIQ that is a worker or a contractor is coming in through our system. So how did that big idea start? So very quickly I just want to share with you, I was working for Meridian Energy and we were evacuated from the building, this is a long, long time ago, and when the first responders turned up, they went upstairs, they came back downstairs, and they were doing this to our HR manager, and effectively what had happened was that we left a couple of guys upstairs, and the reason why they, those guys had stayed there was simply because they knew it was a wormhole six monthly fire alarm test. <laughs> they had a, it was, it, was, it was like about 9.30 in the morning, and we had a board meeting at 10 o'clock, and they were responsible for doing some business analysis for the board paper. They told the floor warden, or fire marshal, to go away. It's an alarm test, this is far more important. But what actually happened was that, there was a light bulb moment for me. How do organisations account for and verify the safety of people that are in their duty of care in the event of an incident? So that's it, that's the problem I wanted to solve. If we had to evacuate this building right now, we go downstairs, we laugh, we joke, we drop our pizza. But if there was 200 people in the building, how do you know you haven't left Mary upstairs? She's choking on the smoke, because she's where the fire is. How do you know that? Our software does that, right? But we can't, we can't give you a mobile app to do that, and it's been doing the boring stuff at the front end, which is tracking you to come on site. So that's effectively what we do. Um, so I want to start off a little bit around I'm going to jump around too, so I'm not going to do a chronological story leading up to tens of millions of dollars, right? We're not going to go down that path. I'm going to take a slightly different approach and jump all over the place. So the first thing I want to share with you is my flight or, my flight or flight story. I love this quote, the greatest things in, in life are on the other side of fear. Everything that you're doing, how many people are actually going to start? Right, okay, so it will absolutely resonate with you. you. You know that there's so many fears you've got to overcome when you're on your journey whether it's raising capital, whether it's just getting out of bed sometimes when you've had that bad sale, that hopeful sale then fall through. But mine started off when I was about 13 when I learned this. And that was, um, I lived in Palmerston North. I went to quite a rough neighborhood. I lived in a rough neighborhood called Highbury. Um, Highbury still is, I think to this day, a pretty much a, a, a gang neighborhood. We had Mungra Wild, we had Black Power, we had, we had everything there. I had a real fear. I was, a, I was this tall when I was 15, but I weighed like 60 kg. <laughs> so when I went to work, I was going to work, one day there was a, we used to have this thing in New Zealand called Telephone, yeah. right? Yeah. Only a certain age people don't even understand what that is. We <laughs> raised company, the country raised money for charities. I was going to Telephone at two in the morning. Now as I came around the corner with a very good friend of mine, again, 13 years of age, um, there was a guy standing on a corner about 50 meters ahead of me. And as we went around the corner to pick up our third friend, he stayed in front of us. And then we picked up our friend, as we crossed the park in Highbury, there was about 15 guys met us and absolutely gave us the beating of a lifetime only because they could, right? So one of the things I walked away from that, but one of the things I learned when I walked away from that was how to take a punch. A punch just really hurt because up to then me and my brother just played, right? Lots of bruises, but I learned a couple of things and that was I actually didn't have the fear that I thought I'd have. You learn how to pivot, you learn how to dodge, you learn how to swing a punch. You learn those things in, in adversity. So the key thing for me was that um, lesson number one was learn to pivot, swing, and move forward whenever you're facing adversity in life, right? Um, and 
those that are on the startup journey or those that are advising others on the startup journey, th this, this is going to ring true in so many ways. And hopefully I can share a little bit more about that, about how we had to pivot as we went through. So, <clears throat> this is not me, obviously. Um, representation of me being sort of alone, walking down the street and about to get um, his head beaten in. And this is me in London. And what happens uh, in terms of a, another, another element to the, to, the, to the pivot story was back in 2019, very early into it, uh, we started um, being approached by the Sharp Corporation <coughs> out of Japan. They were looking for a new product that would help them uh, dynamically shift where they wanted to go to in life. Uh, they, we all know them as uh, like uh, television, uh, television screens, we know them as photocopiers. And they were doing a major pivot in their digital strategy. And so they invited people to go over there and pitch to them. So I'm gonna come back to that later on, but effectively what happened was that my wife and I and my daughter landed in London on this January the 28th, uh, 2020, to roll out and drive that strategy to make their channel partner sales rep, their, their salespeople, successful, right? You can't just stand back, sign an agreement, and hopefully it happens. I had to go over there for six months, and of course we got three months of fantastic growth out of them. Growth went from here to here in the space of 12 weeks. Driving strategy, driving change, finding the champions within that channel partner relationship. Everyone knows what Parado's law is, 80-20. 80% of your sales are gonna come from 20% of your customers, 80% of your problems will come from 20% of your, from, from your customers. And so what, we, what I was trying to do was basically find the champions within Sharp that would then almost be me. They'll be evangelists for who's on vacation. Three months into it, COVID, whole world went into lockdown. Um, I paid, well my company, it paid rent to, for our apartment up to August, and uh, so we weren't gonna get that money back, $40,000 down the tube, so my board decided to leave me there. They said, why don't you stay there, running the company on Zoom from Mangareki, Lower Heart, you might as well run it from, from, from London. So the pivot moment for us was, the whole world's going into lockdown, and no one's gonna be coming into buildings anymore, so how can we, how can we adapt? What's our pivot moment? Our pivot moment was, Organisations came to us and they said, we need to know which people are working from home versus which ones are coming into the office on the odd days or the Wednesday only. So we created, a mo our mobile app was already out, so we created that pivotal moment. <coughs> so my lesson there is basically, you'll have a lot of challenges in life, but be prepared to pivot away from what your core business is if it means retaining your existing business. You're just gonna have to do that on a regular basis. Um, so I wanted to share with you another story. This one is my first user story. This is Jenny and Avril, it's not really them of course. Um, Jenny and Avril were, were my first clients. So back when I started Who's On Location, we were, um, Cloud and SaaS was witchcraft. When you went around talking to enterprise IT managers and information security managers, they, they didn't want to know about it. First of all, if you embedded your product in there, they didn't need to support it, so their empires wouldn't be as, that they, didn't, that they couldn't build a bigger empire, so they weren't motivated to do that. These were real challenges for us. So, um, but believe it or not, we were uh, three guys, basically working out of a garage, an old cliche, and my first client ever was the Ministry for the Environment. So, when I think about that, we were a startup with three staff, no revenue, selling cloud, when I mean, cloud was rich craft, and the first client was a government department. And um, it's a, it was a Jenny and Apple with a, with a receptionist. I still remember their name, not there now. Was, you know, 10 years ago uh, since they retired, they were clearly a lot older than that when I met them. And, uh, but the key thing here was that, um, um, one, of the, sorry, one of the things that I did when I won that first client was I sat there from 7 a.m. in the morning, 7, 7.30 in the morning at Kate Shepherd Place. And I sat in that office and I sat there every day until four o'clock pretending to be a visitor, observing how people used my software. On the Thursday, I started on the Monday, sorry, on the Wednesday, a person came in, they were from Parliamentary Services, and they turned around to Avril and they said, why does this system not remember me? I was only here two days ago, and I come here every week, if not twice a week. And so the lesson for me was, collect data from your observations. Make sure that you understand that you're on a continuous improvement path, but you can't do that without observing. So many people build products and then they sit back and they think, we know what we know, we know how they're gonna use it, and then they don't learn from those engagements. And, and, and so what we did, our product has grown over time based on, on consumer feedback, user feedback, and the users are not just the visitor, it's the visitor, it's the receptionist, it's the facilities manager. And so we introduced really quickly a whole range of features. We were, we were doing a release about every 24 hours. 
I'm going to say we, that's just Tom, Andrew and myself, uh, we're only a team of three, and we were changing the product as fast as we could, you know, make cups of coffee. It was just, it was really, uh, really amazing. So the lesson for me really early on was I never wanted to lose that. I never wanted to just keep on improving the product and then stop. We've never stopped doing that, and it seems really obvious, like every product on the planet that's in your laptops right now has continued to improve. Um, but companies get lazy, and when you get bigger, you, it's very easy to switch from being product and innovation led to just becoming sales led. The only thing that, that, that matters is money. And uh, my lesson there was be, you know, and I've got the benefit of hindsight, of course, is that always try to be an innovation leader, and that comes from listening to customers on a regular basis. Uh, I want to share with you my early failure story. This one really hurt me a lot. Um, my third customer was, or well, potential customer, then became a customer, was a supermarket chain. And uh, I spent, I can't name them, but they're out of Kilburnie, and I sat there <laughs> in this big yellow building, and um, I sat there and I set up a laptop. And what they wanted, so in my previous life, I worked for Coca Cola. And so I knew a lot about Coca Cola, I knew a lot about merchandisers, uh, and how they, how they interact with the supermarket and full shelves, and, the, and, the, and how they set up ends of the aisle and what have you. And what I did here was I approached them and said, I can give you some really critical information to help you become a better business and to manage the SLAs that you have with your merchandisers and delivery people. If I could tell you that Bob the bread delivery guy spends three hours on site in your building, in your supermarket every week, and two hours of that is merchandising, and one hour of that is just doing deliveries, is that, is that information useful? So the head office of that company was just, they just couldn't believe it. They said, oh, we just don't have that information. That'd be incredible. We're paying invoices left, right and centre based on good faith. So they gave me an opportunity to go out to one of their selected supermarkets and I sat there from about 4.30 in the morning mm -hmm. till 6 to 7 at night, 31 straight days in a row, right? Every day, never missed a day, Saturday, Sunday, they never offered me a coffee once, still great to do that. <laughs> Not once, and I just sat there and had a, had a I think it was a, um, it wouldn't have been an iPad back then, it would have been a Windows touch screen. And I just sat there on a chair about this far back from it, and I just watched all these merchandisers come in and use the software. But it taught me that basically we'd built it for people that were, that, that signed into the Ministry for the Environment, which is white collar people. And some of these people, you know, hardly had an education. No, that's no disrespect to them, but they didn't. And they just struggled to navigate. So then we figured out you've got to have the user interface, has got to be really dumbed down, it's got to be quite basic. Um, to the point where, what if they just get to go to New Zealand driver's license and their profile is stored in your system, all they do is go tag and just keep walking. They make it that easy. Um, the Holy Grail, of course, have an app on your phone, which is 10 years later, you just walk into the store and it knows you're there because you've got geofences around the building. So this is the progression of innovation, right? So that was one of my, um, my early failures. It was a failure because on the, at the end of the month, they had to present a report to head office. They loved it. Done deal, rolled it out to 90 sites. You know, um, I sent them the contract, the MSA, and they said, yep, we're going to sign it. On the day that I was driving from Wellington, where I used to live in Karori, to the head office to get it signed, in those days it wasn't, you clicked it, they wanted to sign something, so you print it off and you add a signature page and then you make them sign it. Um, because, cloud was witchcraft, Right? They were used to dealing with Microsoft where you sign lots of paper and all that sort of stuff. Um, I got a phone call to say, we're not going with you, we're going with a competitor who hasn't done a trial, hasn't done anything. That competitor, I found out, had a, just a great relationship with someone on the IT team. So my lesson there was that relationships matter. Right? You don't, you don't, you don't have to have the best product. It's great if you've got the best product and you've got the best service, you've got the best marketing, got the best price, any other great relationships, you're probably, I don't know, you're Elon, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're those guys, right? You're, you've got the unicorn. Um, but the reality is, is that you will be blindsided time and time again by different things that you didn't take care of, you weren't paying attention to. So my advice to anyone in startup is that really nurture your relationships, understand them a little bit deeper. Um, one, of, one of my uh, advisors, and actually an investor in the company, is David Knight, he's sitting in the back there, he's my height, guy with a white shirt and black top, <laughs> gonna isolate you mate. David, um, when I joined, when David came to do some advisory work with us for my sales team, I came from, a, I'm 55, right, so probably the oldest in the room, I came from an era where you were able to sell anything, anything to one person by having a relationship. 
I can tune the world out, tune you in, build a relationship over two or three meetings, have a couple of coffees, here's some more back tickets to the box, and boom, we're, we're making a deal. In, in, in the space of 10 years, we've moved from that type of engagement to sell, all the way through to the, where the buyer knows more than you about your industry, and it's a collaborative sale. So if any of you are doing B2C, I can't comment, but if it's B2B you're doing, you are selling to multiple people. There are multiple people in the buying process, and this already, I learnt that the hard way, way back here, um, by not uh, paying attention to the fact that other people have relationships, and I, didn't, I wasn't nurturing those. I was focused on two things. The manager of that store, and making sure I wasn't annoying him, I just standing there the whole day, and the per one person asked me for the report. I didn't nurture the other relationships, the other influences, so make sure you understand that when you're selling. Um, I've got a few uh, sports anecdotes because I love sports. Um, <coughs> chasing the rainbows and leprechauns, part one, anxiety and frustration. Again, showing my age here, Tom Cruise, Show Me The Money is a great film, that's not the name of the movie, um, but Show Me The Money. So, um, I wanted to tell, tell a story about what it was like for me trying to raise capital. We never raised an A round. So we sold before we ever raised an A round. We had $3 million put into our company, all from friends and family. Um, never raised an A round. I, 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 I can't speak for it, I can't tell you that, that I was bad at raising capital or good at raising, because I raised $3 million, but I was never good enough to raise capital from a VC. So if you ask me how I come to me for advice about VC, you're asking the wrong guy. So I've got no track record. Um, what I can tell you is some things that are quite, they're, they're worth learning. 26,100 kilometer flights, 31 hours and 40 minutes flight time, you've got three minutes to go. And this particular story here, I flew from Wyatt to Auckland, Auckland to Houston, drove from Houston to Austin, had to do a practice sales pitch, like four lots of three minutes, jump on a plane with a bunch of guys there, we flew to San Francisco as part of the Austin Chamber of Commerce, um, we were allowed to pitch to a bunch of San Francisco VCs. Now the interesting thing with this story here was that you were given three minutes. There was only about sort of 15 of us in the group. And um, the invite list that came out, it was a who's who of Silicon Valley and Sandville Road. Anyone that was anyone was going to be at this event. Like 200 people were coming to this event. And you simply go, wow, this is incredible. Like anybody, just name them, name anyone famous in the VC world, they were going to be there. The reality is, uh, other than nervous wreck and anxiety before you go to pitch, is that they send all their associates, right? They don't send the heavy hitters, they don't send the people that actually can see through the gaps. They send a bunch of associates, I didn't even know what an associate was, I thought an associate's got totally, so many calls from associates over the years, I thought it was a high ranking person. An associate in the US was like, it's an intern, it's a graduate, it's a number cruncher, it's someone that just has to work, work, for, the, work for somebody else. But what happened was that I learned that Part of the game of raising capital is again, it's about relationships and you've got to play the game and it's got to frustrate you when you start getting phone calls from people that are associates saying they want to invest in your company. They'll have beautifully crafted emails um, and you'll get opportunities to go and pitch on a regular basis uh, over time. And uh, what will happen is that a lot of these uh, opportunities, um, I'll share with you something about, about them is that, I mean, this here is just for the last 12 months. And I've already been acquired, so why are you calling me? <laughs> right? I was going to do a transition where I had the Star Wars graphic. <laughs> you know, fade off in the distance. But, and I literally, like, this, this list would be like 20 times longer. But what happened though was that you get emails from, uh, from people saying they want to invest in you. But quite one of the hard lessons for me was that you disclose everything because you're already keen. You know, they tell you in the email they want, to, they want to invest in you, you're the right type of company, we're really interested in the visitor management space and the safety space and where it's going. We've been tracking you for the last three years. you never heard of them, but apparently they've been tracking you, right? Um, and then you'll jump on a call at 2 in the morning. I have done, I'm not kidding you, 200, 300 phone calls at 2, 3, 4 in the morning. Um, much to my wife's uh, annoyance. And, uh, and, there, and most of it is collecting data because they need to build up their knowledge and their, and their library of IP about your industry. So when it comes time to really invest, they know more about your industry than you do. If you sit in Sand Hill Road and you get 10 minutes to do a pitch to a VC, on his or her laptop, there's nothing you can tell them they don't know. You tell them that your market's worth 1.8 billion, they'll say, no, it's, it's 1.365. So I've got a Gartner report, we've done this analysis and this analysis. 
Who are your biggest competitors? You'll go and name three, they'll say, they'll name four you've never heard of, and those four are four times bigger than the competitors you name. You haven't heard of them, because you're not in that market, right? So these guys collect data all the time, but the reality is you've got to play the game, don't you, to play you, you've got to be in the game. So I'm not telling you you don't take those phone calls, I'm just letting you know that if it's so early in the piece, you've got, for, for your journey, you've got to ask them what their criteria is. So when they tell you they want to invest in you, you can spend 15 minutes yapping away, give them a sales pitch, right? Only for them to tell you this. When you get to, what's your revenue? Ah, 250,000. Look, you, you have to be at a million dollars. Look, we'd, really, we'd be keen to move forward once you get there. Thanks for spending some time with us. Can we, um, can we, can I touch base with you in six months, see how you go? Sure, right? So the email went from, we've been tracking you for two or three years, and we want to invest in you. Suddenly, the very first hurdle was you were at a million. You're not at a million, you're at 250. You take a phone call, six months later, I'm at a million. You do the same pitch. Oh, we're now investing in our threshold is now two million. When we got to two, it was three. When we got to three, it was four. When we got to four, it was five. And so on and so on and so on. We, for whatever reason, never seem to meet their threshold, right? Yet one of my competitors, two of my competitors, Proxy Click and Envoy out of San Francisco, Proxy Click out of Belgium, met both the founders, wonderful guys, we're good friends. I've had dinner with their wives and we've gone gone out together, it's really great, with their husbands there. Um, <laughs> and it's, uh, they've raised 130 million to do what's on that iPad down. And every time we go to compete with them on the really big deals, we win, right? But we can't compete in the social media lead generation space because they've just got this massive war chest and so Sand Hill Road's decided who's gonna win in this space. You don't get to decide. And that's really frustrating. So um, learn to play the game. Uh, I guess what I'll, what I'll summarise here is that take the calls, disclose information, but very early on, be proactive in asking them. When you're at that stage when someone's wanting to invest in you, ask them what their criteria is. Because quite often you can just take, take the call and cut off within two minutes. Because you'll literally do hundreds of these if you actually become quite successful. And we got successful enough where we had hundreds of these companies wanting to, wanting to acquire or invest. Well, did they? That's the question. Um, Chasing Ray Rose Electric Corns Part 2. So, just conscious of time. Um, okay, we've got, got about another 15 minutes. So, what I wanted to talk about here was um, yes, it's a, an image from Tinder, um, but I've taken out the lady's face. Uh, so, what I want to talk about here is swiping right too early on partnerships. So, we're a B2B company. One of my challenges was in the early days, was I probably sold the first 50 to 100 customers myself, like literally knocking on the door. Remember, no SEO, no real website, didn't understand it, no LinkedIn lead generation, you know, cloud, still witchcraft, right? So I realized that I could clone myself, but I'm selling something for 50 bucks to $300 a month. You can't have someone on 80 grand, 90 grand, 100 grand a year running around with a company vehicle trying to sell a product, that's the, that's the, um, that's the ACV, right? You, you have to, you have to, to, you have to um, expand your sales capabilities and you either do that by raising piles of capital, right? Which is not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, it's just, it just really depends on how you're gonna execute that. We chose to do the following. Most people that buy our product with facilities managers or security managers, they only buy, we understood the personas, they only buy from people they trust, right? They, now you might say, doesn't everybody? No, no they don't. Lots of people today will just go on the internet and just buy something. Um, we bought our CRM without talking, we, we had one demonstration, we didn't know them personally, we never built any empathy with them, we were just some sales guy at the other end telling us how pipe drives worked. And it met the requirements, go boom, we're going to do it. There's no trust there, um, uh, from a personal perspective, but there was from, a, from the fact we asked for references, so you gain trust that way. Um, but what we decided to do was that we're going to have a direct sales force, but we're also going to have a partnership or a channel partner sales force. Why? Because that would give us the ability to expand our sales reach into markets we couldn't otherwise reach without raising a lot of capital. So Johnson Controls, 1,200 salespeople globally, they one of our channel partners. How else will I get 1,200 salespeople to sell, to sell our product? You know, yeah, that's a lot of capital to raise, right? You know, you're talking about raising 20, 30, 40 million dollars. You gotta spend on salespeople, you don't have to do that, but it is gonna cost you commission. So um, some of the harsh lessons I learned here was when we were choosing partners, one of the early mistakes I made was anyone that was interested in selling us, I'd say yes. Yeah. And I'd send off my agreement and they'd come back. And one of my early ones was here in New Zealand, an American security company. I went up to Auckland and I had to do a sales training session. This is 
Like two months after we first got engaged, we've done the whole T's and C's, signed the agreement, signed some, some incentive packages and things like that. And I'm now training these 16 um, B2B salespeople. Now, at that stage, I'm the sales guy. And I've sold 100 of these things by the revenues up to about, I don't know, $150,000. And I'm sitting there going, 16 people, these guys live and breathe security and facilities. This is all they do all day long. They sell CCTV camera monitoring equipment, they sell security alarm monitoring. These guys are rock stars. But if these guys suck, they're going to sell one a week. If they're really bad, they'll sell one a month. But that's still 16 sales a month, right? At the end of a year, how many have they sold? Five. Zero. Hadn't sold one, right? Another situation I had was um, a very large company in the US uh, with nearly 75 different, uh, 75 salespeople across the you know, 43 states. I flew to um, the East Coast of the United States probably three times, one to try and pitch for the deal, another time to close the deal, and another time to launch the deal at the national conference. Right? Um, in the very first year, how many did they sell? Three, for a total revenue of about eight grand. I spent more on that on my, on my flights. Guy, my, my height, I'm not flying, I'm not flying, I, I did fly cattle class. Um, <laughs> once I had a little bit of revenue, I thought, Hell with that, and uh, deep vein and all that sort of stuff, or flying at least uh, premium economy, so I got to do that. But the reality was, what was my, what did I learn from that? What I learned was that the executives of this company were really eager, like me, to swipe right, right, sign up, sign up, because they look good. They can report to the board that they've signed up a new distribution. Uh, it's not exclusive, but they get to sell who's on location. It's going to pivot and change the way we do things. We've got Sir Darren's flying over next month to launch at our national sales conference. He's then got some workshops afterwards to train the salespeople how they're going to sell it. And we'll do a million dollars. I think it was a million dollars in the first year. It was the agreed KPI. Otherwise, we could cancel the agreement. It was like eight grand. Like, and I just said to myself, if these guys could deliver 40 or 50 grand, based on my American, New Zealand American security experience, I think that's at least a good start for the first year, then we'll build from there. The executives will swipe right. But the people that actually have to sell your product, they're selling 50 other products, right? And you have to get their mind share. So I have to resonate with you and understand why would you sell my product? And the second year I flew back and I offered them $30,000 to every solitary sales rep that could sell 10. So not the first person to sell 10, everyone that sells 10 gets $30,000. Now these guys are on about 60,000 US, they make about 10 to 15 grand in bonuses. And I'm offering them 30,000 US dollars. And to sell 10, they could have sold 10 enterprise deals and given me 150 grand so I could easily cover it. They might have sold 10 small plans at $40 a month. And I've just basically lost money hand over fist. It's a method to the madness why I did that. Um, it's about eyeballs on screens and footprints and, and getting um, land wrapped. Um, at the end of that second year, it's all about 10. Um, what had happened was that when I sat back and reflected, all of these guys were my age. They were a male dominated industry, they were old school, they've been around for 50 years, they were all my age, they're all selling. Every other product they sold was client server. So when they demonstrated a product, they could turn it on and just demonstrate it to the product, to the client. They were selling all sorts of different sort of HR software and stuff. Getting them to go out to a Midwestern manufacturer, open up the laptop, ask them for a Wi-Fi access, you know, to create an HQ's Wi-Fi, they didn't even know how to do that. Opening up their phone and hotspotting, they didn't know how to do that. So what I found out, by actually going on the road with two of their reps, they had no idea after two years and sixty thousand dollars in flights and incentives, they had no idea. My product was witchcraft. So, so understand uh, as much as you can. Not about who you're selling to, but who's doing the selling at their end, because the demographic might be wrong. So you've got to understand those people as well. Um, I was going to talk about snow flurries and glass doors very quickly. I um, went to Canada and um, I was pitching for a major a partnership with a company over there. And uh, there was a snow flurry in Boston. And sorry, it was the Canada's Boston. And I was in my motel and the, the appointment was at 2 o'clock, so I left at 12. So I phoned the Uber and they said, Oh, you still get there in an hour, it's only half an hour away. And this snow flurry, not deep snow, it'll be about uh, an hour. I left at 12, supposed to be there at 2, got there at 15 minutes past 2. At, two, at 10 to 2, I phoned the, my contact and said, I'm running 15, 20 minutes late. No, I apologize, stay flurries. I was presenting to like eight people. It was a disaster. I walked in, the CEO just sat there on the laptop for the whole hour, just sat there, never looked up, 
until the last two minutes. And he's looked up and he goes, why couldn't we just build this ourselves? And I'm simply thinking, I've flown all the way from New Zealand and that's your attitude, right? And long story short, it sort of didn't go anywhere. And as I walked out, everyone had sort of left apart from the person, maybe it was you, Joss, and you were my host. And as we're, as we're, thanks a lot, really appreciate the opportunity and um, I'll see myself out. And I turned around and walked and went straight into a massive glass door. <laughs> and the whole thing just sort of didn't shatter, but it just resonated. I thought, that just speaks volumes for this call. <laughs> so you've got to have some really weird moments. Um, I'll just share that one. <coughs> know your why, be a storyteller. Conscious of time. Um, <coughs> so what can we learn from Peter Jackson? Not quite fitting on there. So um, this, is, this is my Sharp story. So Sharp is the Japanese company, the European division, thousands of staff, hundreds of resellers in their own right. So I have, I have access, if I could get them to resell our product, I'd actually have access to several thousand people that could sell our product. Now for all the lessons that I've learned throughout my journey up to that point in time, so this is now uh, sort of 2019, um, I'd have to do things differently. I have to convince my board, and they agreed really quickly, that if we do win the deal, Darren and his wife and his daughter, son can stay home and go after the house, they are going to go to England, they're going to spend six months there, nurturing and finding the champions at Sharp. None of this experiences that we've had up to now have worked, let's learn from that and move forward. So, um, they asked, they put out a tender worldwide. One of them was, it must be multi-language. So if you don't know, there's the kiosk downstairs, it does Tireo, it does 21 different languages, right? At the time, it didn't do zip, it did English, and that was all. Right? So you're up against ProxyClick, a Belgian company that started with about three months of ours. They've received $24 million in New Zealand of venture capital. We've received nothing. Right? So one of the requirements in Sharp's RFP was you must be multi-language. Uh, you must have local representation. We were in New Zealand with one sales rep in San Francisco. Uh, and um, there were several other, I guess I provide 24 hour support, or well, we could do that, but it's gonna be from New Zealand. And you need to be able to have support people that can speak the language of, you know, Belgium, Spanish, Italian, because they were going to sell it into their client base, and their client base speaks all sorts of different languages because they're all over Europe, right? So, 36,670 kilometres, another 48 hours flying there and back. Um, I had an hour, and I think I was about the fifth person to go in there, and I knew who else had been in there before. So, the reason I tell you about storytelling is because I won this deal without um, showing them the product. So imagine going all that way with all those barriers and you win the deal without showing them the product. Now, how I did that was tell them stories. When I walked in there, it was a man fest. It was all guys, right? All 40s, so quite a conservative sort of company, I think, in terms of their hiring. Um, wonderful people, and I don't say that because I made a video, but it's absolutely true. They were wonderful people. And um, I sat down with them, and the, the approach I decided to take, I had my presentation ready, but I decided to say, I've done some research on them on why they were looking for visitor management. And that was because um, their industry, people were not producing as much paper, so no one's doing photocopying anymore. No one's doing document storage anymore the way they were doing it, so they needed to pivot and change strategies. So I needed to educate them on, at that stage, eight years of industry experience that we had. So the stories I told them over the course of an hour went out to an hour and a half, and it was stories around how how when you are selling, when, you're, when, you're, when your team is selling our product into your, your, uh, your client base, you want Sharp to look good. You want your brand to be intact. You want your customers to know that when they're sharing their data with this external system that it's ISO certified, that it's GDPR compliant. You, we, want, we want you to not have a whole lot of problems and trouble as a result of selling our product. So we know, for example, that when you sell it into a large enterprise, that large enterprise might want to deploy it to a very small branch office in Manchester. When they deploy it there, but there may not be a receptionist, there may not be a technical person on site, but you've sent someone on a train or a car, they've gone out to Manchester, they've set up the iPad kiosk and they've walked away. You want to know that if that kiosk lost Wi-Fi connection, that we've told you about it. Because we're pinning thousands of iPad kiosks, we're doing the one downstairs, every 20 seconds. And if we don't get a response, you know, within about three pings, we know it's gone down, so we can send a message if the client wants to set it up to their IT team, and they can do their remote login and, and try and check things. So we told them hundreds, of, like, literally told them hundreds of little, tiny little stories, really quickly, about how we can help add value to the brand of Sharp. And I walked out of there and I flew back, and then I flew back, and then about uh, it's about three weeks later, they said I've finished. They want me to go back again. So okay, now they want to see the product. That was a bit of a waste of time. And I flew back, and they said to me that, that we we now want to see the product. But we've chosen you. 
So um, the, I wanted to just let you know, that doesn't mean that you're gonna get away with that every time, but the power of storytelling is so important. And where does storytelling come from? It goes back to one of my first screens with Avril and Jenny. It comes back to understanding how customers are using your product at a really intimate level. Like observe how people are using your product, they might be difficult to know what your products are. Um, understand that you can capture it with data points. So what we do, and, we, and to be honest with you, we've only learned this for the last couple of years, we're doing things like when someone registers for our product, what's the time delta between when they register and when they accept the terms? When they accept the terms, when do they do the first setup step, the second setup step, the third setup step? When do they add the first employee? When do they sign the first visitor? When did the text message first get received? All those things tell a story about people, how they're engaging in your product, how they're using it. What features do they use? How fast do they turn on the additional features, the value add? What haven't they done? What, you know, that's the, that's the money left on the table. So be really good at storytelling, and you only get that by observing and being involved as founders with customers quite early on. So if you're a developer, that's really hard, but try and find a way to be so engaged with your customers that you get to sit with them um, and share their experiences, and particularly in the early stages of your development. Um, so my lesson there is old Richie, um, be a game changer. So my lesson from Sharp was, you know, help them change the game that they were in. They were in the a B2B business, they were selling hardware, and they're trying to pivot, and we came along and we told them a story about how we can help them play better in that game. Um, and that was my lesson from that, I just wanted to share with you. So another lesson was um, every customer is priceless. So when I first started, we will finish by 22 by the way. Yeah, you're when I, when I first started, um, I came, I did work at Coca-Cola, worked at Meridian, worked at Brambles, uh, Transult was a Canadian energy company. <coughs> Excuse me. And a lot of the things that um, I came were, were, were different in terms of the way I approached customer service. I believe the best investment you can make in marketing is in your customer support team. Why do I believe that? Because they're at the front of your company once the sales reps close the deal and moved on to the next one. They close the deal, move on to the next one. But who's left holding it? Well, today it's customer success, these different roles, of course. But customer support uh, and customer service is actually your, one of your best investments in your marketing engine that you can deliver on. So this bit here, what I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is that your smallest value customer can destroy your brand. At my age, 55, I can annoy the hell out of a customer. I remember going, Coca-Cola, going out to Wainui, Omada, Woolworths, I don't think they're around anymore, uh, Woolworths is, but I don't think well, that brand's countdown now, is it? It was Woolworths back then. And I took an approach where I was so sick and tired of being a, 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 an account manager that would walk up and I had to deal with these buyers. And the buyer knew I had an appointment at two o'clock. And I'd pull up in my Coca-Cola car and I'd stand there and, and at half past two, he still hasn't wanted to come down. Now, is he with another rep? No, he's just having a long lunch. And he's been paid four times. I've sent him text messages on the old motor roll of brick I had back then. <laughs> Um, and so I said to him, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to wait any longer. And so he didn't get his order that week. When I got back, my boss said to me, what, 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 I've already taken a call, he's complaining about you. But the only person he could complain about was really to him. He could complain to my boss. Today, a very small customer that gives you 40 bucks a month can jump on and give you a bad cat terror review, a product two review. They can jump on Facebook, LinkedIn, and they can destroy your brand. So because of that, we don't have bronze, silver, gold customer support. If you, if you pay us a million dollars a year, or you pay us 500 bucks a year, you actually get exactly the same support. So it drives a different culture in our company. It means that our customer support team don't have to be banded. We don't have to triage different things to more important people. Everybody's important. Treat, because you're SaaS. If that widget is broken for the $40 a month client, well it's probably not working for the one that's spending 100,000 with you anyway. So you might you to fix it before the $100,000 client finds out, right? So um, that's my, my lesson there is treat every customer in this world as if they were gold regardless of how much. And there's a lot of other stories I can tell you about why you want to do that. Customer stories, uh, use cases, white papers, uh, spreading the word, spreading the love about your brand. Um, it's all possible. Uh, decision making. Uh, family, friends, shareholders, advisors, directors and colleagues know when to ask for help. So one of the biggest lessons that I learned was I've gone through my life um, largely doing things for myself and controlling, I had to be in control of things. My mum was diagnosed with cancer when I was 14 um, and uh, she died of cancer not that, not that, not that long ago actually. She survived a very long time, she was tenacious and, and, a, and a great fighter. 
Um, but, but I had to do a lot of things. I had to you know, feed my brother and sister. I had to do a whole lot of things that aren't necessarily what normal 14 to sort of 18 year old kids have to do. Um, so that sort of moulded me in the sort of person that I am, but I have to have control, because I can't control other things. I couldn't control my mum's cancer, but I could control other things in my life. So when I started the company, it was sort of a little bit, it's, it's not, I, I can't code, so I'm a, I'm a rare beast, but I, I'm a non-coding founder. So I'm relying on other coders to do it, but I control the product management, I control the direction of the company, I control what we're doing, right up until a certain point, when I sat back and I realised I actually can't grow this business without getting help. Right, so I really needed assistance. I'm not talking about when you have two or three extra staff. You really needed additional support. And you needed support from all sorts of people. So I don't mind telling you guys, this is my, this is not my wife's hands, but millions of dollars in the bank, right? I'm not bragging. In January this year, my wife was sending me a text that I've received three or four hundred times. Hey Darren, do I have enough money in the BNZ account? to do the pack and save grocery shop with Tony today. That's a true text. Like, I've got to bring it up, but I actually don't keep them, right? But that, that's a text message I've received hundreds of times, and the last time I received it was only January this year. And one of the most amazing things of selling my business, my wife said to me, what, what, what are you gonna really enjoy? So I'm receiving those bloody texts. <laughs> and, and, and you yourself just be able to just not care, right? So I'm not, not bragging about money in the bank, I'm just saying that, that that's a really interesting moment for me that, one of the joys I've got is knowing my wife, who's 55 as well, and it's taken us this long. Like, I'm not Zuckerberg that know it when he was 24. I'm not trading you guys, Sam. Right? I'm almost an old guy when it comes to startups. That we didn't get that to where 55. The ability just to go, we don't care. I, I care, because I've come through quite a hard background, but, but I don't care, you know what I mean? So, um, so decision making um, really comes down to, it's very hard to know it all, right? You, you just don't know it all, no matter who you think you are. So you're gonna ask for help. And the help that I got was from a whole range of people because you're not superhuman. So I can't put all this stuff here, but the context of this discussion today, I wanted to put up uh, Wellington New Zealand, Callahan Innovation, Trade, New Zealand Trade Enterprise, CHQ. I've had lots of experiences with, these, with this group. Um, I've, some people, I mean, from, from everything from a $100,000 beachhead grant to establish ourselves in the US, I've received that. I've received from the, I think it's the IRD, I'd have to thank, but look at their logo up, $600,000 in tax credits. What? Why aren't the nurses getting that? But I gave it back. When we sold the business, we gave it back, right? We didn't give it back because they had to. We were told to, and we would have, right? But goes, goes swings, swings, about, um, swings both ways. But the point I want to make here is that there is a community of people that you need that are going to help you succeed, so you should use them. They sometimes wear logos. Sometimes they're quite achievers in the background like Dave, who helped us with sales. Matthew, who was my CFO, that was at Barclays, came out to New Zealand, started with Deloitte, then wanted to help start up companies in the, um, uh, or be a virtual CFO for us, because to hire a CFO is going to cost us a fortune. You can't keep on paying Deloitte and PwC amazing amounts of money when you're sort of the startup stage, right? So um, have some humility, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I know I showed you a picture of, you know, a wallet. But uh, one of our biggest shareholders was someone that just, just helped us out because we really needed a you know, mortgage on the line, all that sort of story that um, a lot of startups have to go through. Um, almost there, my Amtrak story. So jumping around a little bit, I was uh, doing a presentation in Bethesda to a channel partner that promised us the world. They were going to do so much for us, they were going to roll us out, we are going to be exclusive. They had a massive opportunity for us to, to probably double our revenue inside a year. This is what I was told. Um, I'd flown there, I'd met them, um, they were really keen. The second time I came back to New Zealand about a month later, I said, okay, we're going to close the deal. I went all the way over to Washington DC, and when I got there, um, the two key decision makers just didn't turn up while they got tied up in other meetings. And I'm sitting there going, you haven't come to New Zealand once, I've come here twice. And it's not a short trip, it's a long, long way. You know, as I was getting older, those trips were really starting to take their toll on me. Um, and so uh, I left that meeting um, thoroughly disgusted that I've wasted all that time going all that way. And uh, I needed to be in London because I was going to do my sharp pitch, right? Um, so you, obviously you, don't, you, want to, you try and tie all these trips in together if you can to, to get the economies of scale and, and uh, a good use of funds. Um, but I needed to get to uh, London. I hadn't actually booked the trip. I'd only got myself to Washington DC. And I couldn't get to Washington airport 
to get the flight to London because it was ridiculously expensive, like three and a half, four thousand US one way. Just one of those weird anomalies in the, in the matrix where you couldn't get that you know fifty dollar ticket across the Atlantic. So um, I decided to take a train to New York because I could get a flight out of um, JFK, but I had to go and spend a night in New York, which is not a bad thing. So these are some of the great things that happened to you. You can share some experiences. And when I got to um, Washington DC, Electrical Union Station, um, the train station there. And I went first class, which is like, you know, an extra 50 bucks, and you know, a glass of wine and a meal. I went to go through the first class lounge, there's only six people in there. And as I walked out, they said, you can now board the seat. I walked out, and there's this guard, there were two guards sitting there with these massive guns. And uh, I thought, this is really over the top for first class entrance. And they were patting me down, I thought, this is really weird. And um, when I got on there, um, there was only one man on that, on, that, on that train. And he was in the seat, I think it was 13B, and I was, I was 13C. I had to go and sit down beside him. And I didn't look at him, because there was these two huge guys, that like linebackers in American football, just sitting opposite him. And I sort of, did, I sort of deliberately did, didn't want to look at him. And as over the next sort of 15 minutes, while other people came on board, there were these people whispering, oh, that's, that's, that's him, you know, that's that guy, that's that guy. Oh, I've got to look at the guy down. I looked over him, and he just smiled at me and said hello. And of course, it was, it was Joe Biden. And we spent 10 minutes talking. And it was just a wonderful experience. He talked about John Key. He talked, to, he talked about, um, which is the you know, left wing versus right wing, he was talking about the wonderful experience he had in Milford and playing golf and how he loved New Zealand and he loved Hobbits and Peter Jackson and, and the All Blacks, he loved the All Blacks. <laughs> but it, but it, was, it was really engaging and um, it's not Photoshop, it's a real photograph. The, to this day it annoys me that I didn't have my phone on HD and I felt so corny asking him for a selfie. But of course at that stage I was about the 20th person to ask him for a selfie. Um, but. Uh, the, going back to my meeting earlier in the day, uh, your objectives need to align. I hadn't actually, for all the lessons I learned right up to that point in time, I'm on my way to see Sharp, I've forgotten the fact that these guys were telling me they were keen, this is the part that I was trying to get up, they didn't turn up to the meeting, but actually something else was far more important. I hadn't, even though I understood the skills of sales and negotiation, like in a previous life I was New Zealand salesperson of the year for all of New Zealand, for every industry. I actually held that award in 1999, it's so long ago. So I don't think I had a lack of skills, but you've got to keep on practicing those skills. I'd forgotten to practice what I already knew, and I'd really not ticked the box. So you constantly learn, um, but from a partnership perspective, make sure your objectives align, and sometimes uh, you know, good things happen for you. Um, and I think meeting him was really cool. I said it to my kids, and I said, you're not allowed to post it. My daughter was at Chilton, and my son was um, at uh, um, St. Bernard's, and I said, you're not allowed to post this on any social media, it's just for you. And um, my daughter came back and said, who's this? <laughs> um, I'll just wrap up with my M&A story. From lockdowns and millions in 36 weeks. The reason why I can't tell you the figure is we signed an NDA, and I'll have to disclose um, how much we sold for, which is absolutely fine, I respect that. Um, wonderful inquiries, MRI. So how did it start? Sitting in London, uh, COVID hit, and we started getting a whole lot of phone calls. The, rep, the, the acceleration of people wanting to buy us or invest in us became exponential. I thought maybe it's because they thought we might be in trouble. You know, at that stage, we're at sort of 4,000 facilities worldwide, we're like 42 countries now, we're 46 and over 5,000. But at the time, I thought, oh, they're looking at us as an easy target to buy. Um, I was 54 at the time, and I'm sitting there thinking, what do I need to do to really expand and grow this business exponentially? How do I become a $100 million company, $200 million, $300 million? How do I do that? How I do that is by raising capital, right? So I thought, well, some of these calls are about raising capital. Let's go and talk to them. I talked to them, they were a little bit more engaging this time than to now ticking all the boxes around revenue and stuff than, than the early attempts. Um, but then I took some calls from people that wanted to acquire. And so I, it's my duty of care, I, have to, I can't just make the decision. Um, it's a village now, my company. So I engage with my leadership team, I engage with my, actually not my leadership team at that stage, I engage with my board and a couple of the, 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 the um, larger shareholders beside myself. And we decided that actually for us to accelerate our growth, we needed to become part of a bigger engine that at the end of the day, raising capital out of New Zealand, we get every story about it, we get Venn being sold, zero being invested in, and all that, it's still really, really difficult, right? I've got stories, 100 stories about Sand Hill Road about how they won't invest in a company because you're in New Zealand. Well, this one won't invest if you're not even in San Francisco. This one won't invest if you're in San Francisco, but on the wrong side of the bay. <laughs> they won't even do that. Like, they will make you change your head office to invest. It's a brutal world. So, um, M&A process, what we did is we said, well, we don't know about this, we don't know how to go navigate this, never done it before, so what I'm going to do is go for three M&A advisors, make them pitch to us, so we went with Quorum, wonderful company out of Los Angeles, come out to New Zealand on a regular basis, I don't know if you've heard of Quorum, great company, we didn't choose them, but great people, 
Uh, we, tried, uh, we looked at uh, um, peak technologies out of San Francisco, a small boutique firm, maybe they had about four or five advisors all out of Wall Street. Um, done a few deals before, but not really many in the uh, APAC region. And then we had Growth Point Technology Partners. Uh, Growth Point Technology Partners, we chose them because, we didn't choose them, but we chose to put them into the pitch. Uh, the pitch back to us because Abbott Legal, which is our law firm, had done quite a lot of deals. So Abbott Legal is our law firm, probably done 18, 19 deals. It's Murray and Bruno and those guys. And they asked us to, um, they, I went to them, who would you recommend? They said, oh, this company because we've done nine deals with them. You know, Scott Houston had a green button, a few names I might not ring a bell here, but we ended up putting them through a process. We ended up making them pitch to our board. I was sitting in London, they were in the States. My board was all over New Zealand. And they were pitching to us three, four in the morning, my time. And lo and behold, we ended up choosing one of them. Um, great process. What they did is they, they expanded our risk. They asked me, other than due diligence and asking us to upload hundreds of documents about standard operating procedures and finances and all that, the actual process sort of looks like this. Who do you think's going to buy your company? You've been doing this for 10 years, so you sit there and send them a spreadsheet of all the low hanging fruit. They then go, and you've probably got 20 or 30, they then go and add 150, 150, they made it 151, right? So they do this all the time for a living. So they said, we're going to approach these 151, and the, the weekly report comes out and it's got approach. 151. The next column over here, they're trying to move you to the left, right? The opposite of the timber. And in this one, they'll say feedback received. And the next column, and it sort of goes like this 151, and you've got nothing. Then a week later, hopefully you've got eight here and three there. And eventually getting all the way through to they want to see a they want to see a pitch. Right? I did 40 about 47 pitches. Um, some of them are double up, so I did the same one twice to different groups in that company. They were always one, two, three, four, seven, you know, in the morning, they're always quite hard times to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, at the end of that, you know, you ended up with some, the ultimate is you're trying to get them to a stage to get into your DD room. We ended up with about 15 in the DD room. And then from there, we ended up with six offers. What did you do uh, To do diligence. So, um, Growth Point Technology Partners used like a Dropbox type service, but it's called Box. And we had to upload everything up there, so it's all encrypted and what have you. And uh, the end result was that we ended up with six offers. We ended up going for negotiations, got down to two. And uh, I'll tell you what, one of the interesting things with those two was they're both backed by billions of dollars of VC and PE money. And when you're negotiating, you think that um, the last million doesn't matter. Like the last million to us matters, right? That, that matters a lot. Um, so I'll see, I don't know if it is a secret, I was a 26.67% shareholder when I sold the company. So if, if we if we get an extra million, right? You know, it's a it's um it's a really nice car, or it's a great deposit for my son and my daughter to share for a house. I mean, these things are material these days. You know, this is big stuff. Um, and a million dollars to these guys is nothing. Right? They're already paying this much. Already offers this much. Like, just add that little bit there, and you and you want it because psychologically you, you've set your head around. You've gone through a journey in your head, and they just won't give it to you. And you don't understand why. And we had one of them walk away. And then they bought a they bought a competitor of ours, but they, they actually walked away. The one that bought us, but didn't actually walk away. But the one that did walked away over a million dollars. And if I, I could share the figures with you, it's nothing. It's a rounding error, right? But you understand that the people on their side of the deal team are incentivized to do a deal at a certain point. And every every hundred I don't know how it works, but every hundred grand saved, maybe they get in twenty points. So what seems like nothing to you, a lot to you, but nothing, it should be nothing to them, it's actually a big deal to the people on their deal team. So understand your deal team. You go through the M&A, understand the people that are on the other side of the equation, what motivates them, it's really difficult to do, but ask them outright. Um, anyway, we went through, we, we started in August, and we ended up um, signing about the 30th of December, our LOL, so letter of, LOI, letter of intent. Uh, the only condition was, well, there was a bunch of conditions, one was um, due diligence within 45 days, we had 45 days of due diligence, then we had three days off, we could just go out to Christmas, uh, New Year's break, and then we're straight into it, into the DD room, really full on, lots of questions, they'll ask you all sorts of things. Um, and, and at the end of it, you end up, the money changes hands, but right up to 24 hours later, they could be changing, like 50 grand here and 60 grand there, even though you've done the deal. So all of your, live, all of your staff have holiday pay, if they want, a hand, if they want to buy the company, Debt free and cash free, so you get to keep the cash that's in your bank account. Then debt free means the liabilities, and the liability is your staff holiday pay. So they calculate that, and I'll take 60 grand off. <laughs> like, that's like the coffee bill for your PE food that owns you. What are you doing? But it all matters, right? 
So devil's in the detail, be aware of that. Um, so have faith in the journey. So just my wrap up screen, I think one more screen after this is have faith in the journey, enjoy the journey. There's lots of ups, there's lots of, lots of downs. Um, but just make sure that you know as you go through as you go through the process, you you um, you have to take stock and take care of your own mental health. And this is not a speech about mental health or anything like that. It's so important to get that right that you have to become quite resilient on your startup journey to um, to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. Whether you're trying to build the world's best product, get your own exit. It's very very difficult just to walk in, build a product. And look at the, you, we always look at the successes, we'll always look at those guys that have those headlines, sold for this, sold for that, sold for this. But behind 99% of them, there's just years of hard work and craft. Um, so, dream big, start small, but most of them all start. And um, my journey's gone from getting my head, head beaten in a hybrid um, to having a successful exit, and um, that's been my journey. Thanks. <laughs>
you always have to build the minimum viable product. I never did, right? Um, I've got feature creep disease. So I'm a founder that always wants the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. So, yeah. so um, I believe in minimum lovable products. So minimum viable products, when you put something out there, it only does the absolute minimum, then you sit back and wonder why they didn't take it up. So then you write it off and you go down another path. If you, buy, if you actually commit to a minimum lovable product, it's probably a little bit better than the minimum viable, but it definitely is, but it's not the holy grail. Then you get some really good feedback on whether that, how that customer, you know, how you have how, how, some validation in the market as to whether or not that product's worthwhile going forward. So first of all, build the minimum level product. In terms of validation, um, for me, as a pure sales guy, because that's my background, yeah. it really comes back to, are people willing to, are they willing to pay for that product? And you've got to find that out as fast as possible. It's the only thing that I can see that initially that's going to tell you whether or not you've got a viable product. Now, there's different, top, there's different things of validation. Validation is not just, I've got a product that someone paid me 50 bucks for it, therefore it's validated, I'm gonna build it. There's lots of parts to that validation. So can you get someone to trial the product? Yes. Can you get someone to pay for the product? Yes. Can you get someone to, can you get more than one person to pay for it? Because maybe that first sale was to your mate, right? When it's the environment, bought the product, and tell you this, there's lots of other stories, but it took them six months. So they used the product for free for six months. Then they, I said, what's the value then? They told me what they prepared to pay for it, right? But but then but, but what happens though is that as you get one customer, you need two, you need three, you need four. So the only validation you're going to get is are you growing? Um, really, really, nothing else. Nothing else matters until you're raising capital. Then it's a different equation. So while you're trying to prove and validate the viability of that product, you need to get it sold. It needs to be used by more than one, two, three, four people. But when you're trying to raise capital from mum, dad, brother, sister, uncle, or a VC, that's a completely different answer. And that is that they want to know what well, maybe your family don't, they'll be a little bit more, they'll just help you out. But when you're raising capital, you need to show velocity of sales. One of the things I learned from all those people that were trying to approach us, one of the things that I didn't understand, and I couldn't understand, why did my competitor, that quite frankly, their company product was okay, I wouldn't rubbish it, but it was average compared to ours, why are they getting $100 million and I can't raise a dollar? Right? And every time we're in the market, we kill them. Because they started a couple of years after us, they got as big as us within three years. Their velocity of sales was that much, that much bigger. Nice. Cool. Um, question? Any questions? We'll wrap up uh, with that. Oh, nice. <laughs> what are you going to do the coming years? So, what was that one? What are you going to do the coming years? What am I going to do? So, um, uh, I don't think I think you know I go to you go I go to my grave with my integrity, so I want to keep that intact. And what that means for me is that I want to make sure that my my first year of being acquired, that I'm doing everything I can to transition our company and our culture across to MRI's culture. There are three and a half thousand people. We were 20, 23 when we were acquired. We were really fast, dynamic. We have fun. We play pool. We do lots of things together. We do you know we have burger competitions. You know we, we do all sorts of really fun, cool things, right? Um, we didn't do what Travi did and have a slide from one floor to the other. <laughs> for that. But we're, we're a pretty cool company, and now, now we're going to become, becoming part of a corporate. So I want to make sure that the transition of culture values and that transitions across quite smoothly, and that if we're going to lose some people because they don't resonate with the new culture, that I help them through that transition. That's my first obligation. So I also have an earnout. So um, between us, Chatham House Rules, and this office here, we have an earnout. So we have to work for a year before we get the last ten percent of our payment. So that finishes up in March, and we won't get the payment to July. So it takes PwC a couple of months to do your books. So I've committed in my head right through till then. But then I've added another year as a bare minimum. And I've told them this, I'm gonna add a year because I think at the end of that year I wanna be unencumbered from the stresses of transition and trying to earn more money from the earner. And I wanna be able to deliver a lot more value to you that I wasn't able to deliver. So when I went to sell the company, I was asked, why are you selling the company? I want a bigger engine behind me. Why do you wanna do that? So we can deliver the things that I haven't been able to do to this day. I wanna really see some things come to fruition. So why would I sell the company and then and then, and then pay lip service to that and go and leave. I still want to see some things done, but my objective in, you know, in two years' time is I'm going to do a reset and, and figure out. Um, what I'm passionate about is innovation and you know, um, uh, helping some other companies innovate. Help, uh, not innovate, not a code, but helping them down their path <coughs> of their journey to be part of that. So giving, giving back to the community in some way, yeah, whether that's through direct investment or advice. Oh, yeah, sorry, just one point. <coughs> what does it cost you personally? What's it cost me personally? Personally, yeah, in um, terms of so, this, so, this journey that you've gone on. Yeah, so, 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 so first of all, all the money I made from, from computer associates is gone. <laughs> uh, <coughs> it cost me um, time with my family. 
I've spent literally hundreds of days away. Um, you know, I got, I got pneumonia in Las Vegas at a, at a conference, couldn't come home for four or five weeks. I probably missed my daughter and son's birthdays, they're 22 and 21, so Sam's 22 is a QA engineer with us. I think I missed about seven of his birthdays, and my daughter, I think I missed, I would have missed seven as well. Can't miss a different number, can I? <laughs> yeah, so I would have missed about seven of their birthdays. Um, I missed critical moments, my wife uh, got cancer, and she survived, but she had really bad cancer, and she got that about, uh, um, about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, and I was doing a critical trip overseas and she didn't want to tell me, so I was away for three and a half weeks. She knew two days after I left, kept it to herself, so that was a, that was a toll on me mentally that I wasn't there, but, but, but I had the, a great support, so all she wanted me to do was be successful, be successful for her and us and the family. Um, the other toll has been, you know, I've had, I've had uh, I can't name names, but I had a, a couple of people involved in my company, one in particular, that added tremendous value. Um, but, but had to move on for various reasons and uh, sort of lost that relationship with that person which really frustrates me because it was for the wrong reasons that are the tolls. The tolls are all sort of really personal. Um, uh, health wise, um, I don't know, 55, I think I, I think looked after myself a little bit. But you, you won't, I won't know for 10 more years, right? <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think that's a perfect way. Both of that statement is just as a great way to summarise what we do this for. Right? Yep. The idea of giving back and see what it is that you don't have to touch the same hot stove to know it's hot. Frankly, with startups, in my last four years of seeing, is really the initial stage which is so exciting. I've got an idea, I can't wait to do it. And that little turmoil of uh, divots and empathy that not shares often, and there's the other end. When you pull back the drags and you go, aha, I've done it, I've got acquired. So these middle areas need to be shed light. And thank you for that. And thank you for what you will do when you have done it. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thanks, Rakina. Uh, thanks, Emily, and the, the geographer. Sorry, I forgot. For, nice, but but uh, thanks for hosting. Appreciate nice. it. Thanks for coming out. Nice. Great.